I think when you show your emotions, you show where your vulnerability is. People tend to help you. People tend to to connect with you versus you being that like tough person all the time. I got, I have everything, and I'm in control. If you show that, hey, I need help and ask for help, people are more likely to help you. I think my only rebuttal to that is. Hello, friends. Welcome back to Eat, Read, Sleep Drinks and Discussion segment. And this week, we are bringing to you the Art of War and Don Julio's 1942 Tequila. My name is Kalina. And I'm Tapas. And we're going to have a lot of fun today, you guys. So tequila is actually my poison of choice. I love tequila. Do Not you? mine. Oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm a whiskey scotch guy. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, and this bottle actually Tapas got for me for my birthday. So thanks so much, buddy. Mm-hmm. So, um, tequila, I, yeah, shake that up. All right. I I I like that top bottom method. Yeah. I I, I can't drink tequila like straight. I need it chilled at all times. Well, that's a good point that you said because 1942, the signature way of enjoying it is actually chilled or neat. So, um, this is a sipping tequila. So it's a very good tequila. So if you're going to shoot it, I probably wouldn't recommend this one. I'd probably go with, with a, a cheaper one that would be uh, it'll, it'll easier in your pocket. If you're at a club or a bar, uh-huh. it'll come out to like 50 bucks a shot. So you probably don't want to shoot it anyway. Yes, definitely. <laughs> it's a nice sipping one. Um, and I really like this one because uh, this is an Añejo. So Añejos are usually aged um, at least two years. And this is probably one of the smoother ones, uh, which is why it's so popular. A lot of people like it is because it's so smooth because it's one of the old older um añejos so usually uh, about two years this one is actually two and a half closer to three years which puts it onto the border of almost an extra añejo but Mm. not quite extra so very good one if you guys haven't tried this go ahead and do this and if it's too steep for your pockets which it is for us so that's Mm -hmm. why thanks for getting this for me for my birthday (laughs) um don julio's second best choice this is actually their original añejo this is um a third of the price of this 1942 and just as good and a very good alternative to it so as you can tell this bottle is a little empty we usually do this one (laughs) (laughs) at the end of a, a hard day um and the story of 1942 actually it's named at 1942 is because that was um it's an ode to the year that don julio actually started his um tequila making uh for his own company so yes that was really cool so thanks for chilling oh my gosh these are so cute i like these little glasses i haven't seen these before it's um etched of the the world World. very worldly all right so cheers cheers to you guys at home hopefully you've got a tequila with you as well sipping with us Mm. really good and it's so you don't make that that alcohol taste you know yeah. you're drinking, you're like <laughs> yeah no it's pretty much tequila i know that's why I didn't, I didn't drink it as much as before uh because tequila made me give me that face you know that you make the after you drink tequila face, like you yeah. need to shoot it down with something like a lime or salt yeah this one you can just drink it straight and it just tastes so good yeah so. very smooth i like it yes okay so let's get into art of war guys yes much anticipated i have been a big fan of this book for a very long time okay um, and then I, I've, I've kept on asking, like, hey, can we review this book? Can we do-? And you're like, yes, we'll do it eventually. But yes, we've only got a chance. So, so excited. we actually have read Art of War before. Yes. Before we did Eat, Read, Sleep, we actually had a podcast before this. And mm-hmm. we did Art of War for this before. Um, and spoiler, this is the interpretation of the actual book, Art yes. of War, because yes. I believe the actual book itself is very dense mm-hmm. um, and is open to a lot of interpretation. Yeah. So the author of this book, Stephen Kaufman, um, puts his two cents on the art of war. So we actually summarized the summary yes. of art of war yes. itself. Yeah, and you know, there's a lot of um, mystery around this book, right? Um, I know uh, they said that Sun Tzu, they don't even think so. There's some conspiracy that it was not even a real person. This is a collected writing from m- multiple people, multiple generals in the army. The amazing about this book is that it's, it stood the test of time. It's a classic book. It's been around since, well, 500 BC. So all this time, it's still oh. going strong. Okay. Um, but it's one of those classic books. And it's, I know it's about war, mm-hmm. but the the application today is around leadership in everyday life and okay. how you can mentally prepare. So yep. 
I can't wait to get into discussion with this. Let's kind of debate that because yeah. I don't necessarily think a, a lot of it generally, yes, but there are some things that I feel like we've moved away from and may mm -hmm. not be as accepted in today's society okay. that we can All right. kind of discuss through yes. that. This book actually reminded me a lot of 48 Laws of yeah. Power, what we did, and <laughs> what I feel like is um, I imagine... Robert Green going through this book and saying, yeah, there's more than 13 rules in here. <laughs> yes. I'm going to make a book called The 48 Laws right, of Power and right. it's the exact same thing. Yes. I <laughs> very see that. Similar. I see that. Um, so very uh, fun to read through. And what's more fun, I think, is like you said, the interpretation of it and mm -hmm. how you think you can apply it. Because if you take it for face value, it is about war. Mm -hmm. But if you reflect on it and say how you can apply it to your own life at work um especially like in a corporate world mm -hmm. it's definitely kind of the same thing yeah. war and work <laughs> yeah pretty much that's so true we have also a summary on this book where we act out the war and work um concepts together so if you guys get a chance check that one out too and you guys will see like about 20 minutes of just kalina yelling at me as as the captain so that's also that, fun i'm gonna say uh did not take a lot of acting <laughs> yeah. for me that part came very natural. naturally <laughs> <laughs> okay right. so art of war what's yes. this about let's go through there's uh 13 chapters in this book an intro and then 12 chapters mm -hmm. or um he calls them 12 books and there he breaks down the art of war all right so what's the first book on art of war about so book one is called considerations and estimation for war and i think this is kind of the groundwork the blueprint for war you don't go into war unless you know you're going to win the war yep. um and you set up your men for success you decide how to pick your men and you decide how to treat your men and what type of war you're going to go into yeah and one one of the um, takeaways was you need conflict in your life that's what he said like, you know without conflict if it, whether it's internal external you need conflict in order to grow and become a better person um and and i mean obviously you need conflict to start a war but also you need internal conflict at all times to progress so i yeah. kind of that was one of the things that i when i first started reading i was like yes that's sort of because yeah. you know a lot of people will think that you need just a peace of mind you just need to be at, at a complete like homeostasis yeah but he's saying that you need the conflict at all times yeah. in, order, in order to grow. So. And it's very important concept to embrace when you work, mm -hmm. right? Because a lot of times I think people, they see conflict, they automatically go like, oh my gosh, like why do I have to deal with this? Because mm -hmm. we don't like to expect conflict. And right. earlier today we had a, a private conversation just about life in general. And you shared with me this idea, this daily affirmation of expecting three things mm -hmm. wrong to go three things to go wrong in your life every day. And when that happens, you're like, oh, hey, conflict one, conflict two, right. conflict three. And at the end of the day, if you didn't have three conflicts, you're like, okay, cool. Yeah. You know, like, so it's that idea of embracing conflict that allows you to grow and live your life fruitfully. Yeah, it's and it's it is very, very important to have that reminder at all times. And I think, um, you know, in, in, especially in war, um, you need that conflict to kind of Keep you grounded for what, why you're fighting this war. Too. Yeah, you know, you need to remember the why behind it, yeah. um, and that that kind of really helps kind of keep the not only keep you going, but also keep your army, keep your troops going, yeah. and in a workplace, kind of keep your team going. They yeah. need to know, hey, this is the issue that we're working on. And I need you guys as a team to help me out with yeah. this. This is the greater purpose. It's, and exactly. we, we sacrifice and we fight and yep. we we get down and dirty. But at the end of the day, it's for a greater cause is yes. what we're doing it for. Yeah. Conflict is inevitable. And you just have to decide if this conflict is going to lead to construction or destruction yes. of yourself and those around you. Yeah. And then another part of the book is around I mean, the, the book one is around like making sure that your your team is or your your army is ready for battle and they make preparations. So you have to be mentally and physically ready for it as well, which I think a lot of times people are not at that stage. Right? Okay. They're there. A lot of times they're just kind of um, jumping into things. You know, there's a, a there's a, an, an area that they want to uh, pursue or there, there's a conflict they want to arise, but they just Sounds like me. <laughs> jump right into it without even thinking it through. That's what I do most <laughs> right. of the time. But, you know, he said, and, and, and one of the things that he said, I know it's in the book, but he also talked about how, like, if you don't know yourself and you don't know your enemy, mm -hmm. then you've already lost the war. Yeah. You have to know yourself. You have to know your enemy. You Being know, prepared is yes. very vital. Right? That's that's so a true. common thing theme along this whole mm -hmm. book is if you're not prepared you're going to lose yeah the last sentence of mm -hmm. this book i know is one of your favorites yeah. he says um do what i tell you to do you will then always be successful in war if you ask what happens if he does 
does the same thing to you, you do not understand what I'm talking about. Study deeply. Yes. Why is this your favorite line? What he's trying to say is that it's not about worrying about what other people are, are doing. Yes. It's not about what other people are thinking yes. about or their preparations. It's about you yourself. Yep. And how are you going to change your um, mindset? How are you going to change your approach to things? Don't worry about what other people are doing. Yeah. And and that's why he said like that's why he said if that's your if that's what you're struggling with, then go back and read the book because you're not getting what I'm trying you to tell you. You don't understand it. Yeah, you're not fighting your own war. You're trying to yes. worry about everything else. So appreciate that. Book number two: Preparations for War. Yes. What does this mean? So this is just about making sure you have supplies, right? So you want to make sure. And he says in in terms of food, money, weapons, you want to have all those things. Um, whereas when you think about it in the corporate world, you want to make sure that. You have proper things in place like a pay structure, a good management team, training is all there yeah. in order to get this conflict resolved. Right? Mm -hmm. You want to make sure that you are fully prepared and you have all of the necessary ingredients before going into war versus, again, pressing the button and going straight towards and you and you, you end up. And he says in the book, a lot of war is lost because the troops over time don't have the ration. They don't have the resources they need. Yeah. And then they the 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 army itself will be defeated because you just kind of wait it out. Mm -hmm. So if you on your end are well prepared for whatever is going to be happening, how long, however long it takes, your, your army will stay fine. The other yeah. army, if they're not prepared, they're going to end up yeah. coming up. He also mentions uh, having the right weapons to give to the right person. Mm -hmm. Like they have to know how to use that weapon. Yes. So if we're looking in the corporate world or the working world, it directly translates, right? Mm -hmm. If you don't have the training, if you don't give them the resource and the time, mm -hmm. a lot of companies now, they, they cut back on, on their people, right? In Art of War, he says, if you need 500 men to fight, you have a thousand men to right. fight, right? Corporate world, we look at it the other way. They're like, if we need 500 people to work, we're going to figure out how to get 250 people to do this amount of work. Right? Yep, that's so and true. that's why a lot of people get burnt out. They're exhausted. And when you have people tired and exhausted, they can't keep on fighting. Yep. Quiet and quitting. <laughs> quiet quitting. That's, yep, that's, that's what it leads to because yep. you're, they're so burnt out and worn out. Yeah. And another thing he mentions in this book is around respecting all positions so like don't overstep it or, or don't 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 think of anyone and as lesser than you mm -hmm. right you ha you're going to need everybody around you and in, in, in the example he gives is that when you're at war you're going to need the peasants of the town if you have good terms if you're in good terms with them and you have a good relationship they will go out of their way to help you out they will go out of the way to make sure your your um Army is you well get supplied. your supplied food, yeah. all of that. But vice versa, if you have a really bad, uh, bad um, relationship, they might end, end up turning against you. They, mm -hmm. That's when they'll start attacking you, guerrilla warfare, yeah. right? So yeah. he says, like you know, you have to treat everyone with respect, and you shall get earned yeah. respect. I was surprised at that because I didn't understand really, because I, I think that if you're fighting a war, why would the people of that country help? you right mm -hmm. it's an automatic assumption that people are against you but this helped me understand that people aren't necessarily against you because at the nature of things people care more about themselves right and so the peasants and the merchants that he talks about at the end of the day yes they would prefer their home country win but at the end of the day they need to also survive they mm -hmm. need money they need to sell their goods and they're not being picky who they sell to right they'll sell to whoever wants yep. to wants to buy their stuff and that's why they will ultimately help you it's the same mindset that we should have because at work it's very easy for us to look at people and say like they're either below me or they're mm -hmm. not on my side they're not on my team but if you understand people and you can play that mental game and you're politically um above ground about it people will help you no matter what okay. because if you can figure out a win-win situation everyone will help you so true book three is the nature of attacks yes so one of the key highlights here is Unless absolutely, absolutely necessary, never use force when taking over. Yeah. Right? I think I like this theme because it goes over his whole, uh, you think this book is a art of war, but mm -hmm. honestly, the art of war is not having to fight exactly. war. How yes. do you do everything you can to avoid war? Yes. And that's what this book is about. Yeah. All of that and the preparation so that you don't necessarily need to fight. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, going back to the corporate world, right? You know, when you start to threaten your team mm -hmm. or give ultimatums, you know, that that's when you end up trying to have a lot more conflict within your own army or your team, right? You you want to avoid that. You want to make sure that um, you are obviously not threatening your own your own people. Mm -hmm. And and of course, you want to make sure you kind of wait it out and let, 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 let your side um, overwhelm the other side. 
Yeah. Uh, he points out four things in which you can do to bring the destruction of your own army, mm-hmm. right? So knowing when to attack, but not attacking, and then vice versa, knowing not to, but then forcing the issue right. and attacking. Um, the second thing is causing an unnecessary retreat by mm-hmm. not correctly employing resources. The third is considering the needs of the troops and, mm-hmm. and the people fighting for you. And then the last one is constantly changing orders without logical reason. Right. As I was reading this, all I was thinking about was our corporate, our yes. previous life and working. I was like, oh my gosh, every single one of those <laughs> things yeah. happened. Yeah. So how do you explain that? So if you were to go through your points, one, two, three, four from the corporate world, what do you, s- you see? Like for the corporate world, for, for employees, especially like not taking a stand or showing support when a situation calls for it, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's kind of going back to not attacking when you should, right? Yeah. And attacking when you shouldn't. Um, insufficient training explanation. So that's the resources part, right? Yeah. You, if you if you don't provide your team with the proper training and resources, then they're going to just kind of not know what to do with their job and they're yeah. going to be ill-prepared. I think with the training part, it's also really important to realize that they need the time to train as yes. well, right? Because the one thing that I think our last company did really well was they did provide a lot of training. But I think they expected a lot of that training to just happen miraculously without yeah. being given the time to do so. So right. how do you also make sure that the training is there, but also allowing them the time as part of your job to do the training and to check up and follow and make sure that training is understood yeah. and properly executed. Yeah. And also making sure that the training is there as a health tool. Yeah. Right? A lot of times, and especially in our, in our previous company, training was a burden click, like, click, you, click, like, click, hey click. i need you i need this done by this date mm-hmm. asap kind of thing and then so the the employees would just go through and just run through yeah. quickly and then they'll ask you questions later on down the line like hey how do i do this like if you did, if the, you training, did the training you would have known and then you don't want to be that boss that says that like yeah. if you do the training but it's like well they're like yeah i couldn't do it because you would tell me to do it in the middle of a work week or yes. whatever so you want to make sure that if you're going to provide a training make sure that you provide ample time to do it outside of their normal duties yep what does not considering the needs of the troops mean? So our favorite new word, um, not creating psychological safety, <laughs> right, yes. for the team to raise their concerns. Yeah. So considering what they need, what their concerns, exactly. what their worries are, what's going through their mind, because I think a lot of times people in the field or maybe at a store storefront level don't necessarily know what's going on up top. So the message that the top sends down, like, People don't always understand. They can't connect it. And the last one is around constantly changing orders without logical reason. This is kind of kind of self-explanatory in the corporate world. Like, great. A lot of rollouts, updates, realignments, all that kind of stuff. C- creating any kind of instability uh, in, in the company yeah. can create this kind of, <clears throat> you know, like the, the, the people would just become so disengaged. Yeah. They're, they're like, I got a new boss again. Or this is good. Now, like, now the company's going to completely U-turn from what they were doing before. Now we have to do all these things all completely different. I think um, having constantly changing it without thinking through what, how the troops and how your people are going to align to it. You know what a tall tale sign of that is, as you're saying that, um, it's employees constantly questioning if they're they're still going to have a job. Yes, I remember yes. going through so that a lot. Like every quarter or every six months, we'd be like, "Oh my gosh, a change is happening. Are we going to have a job still?" And that instability is very frightening, and mm-hmm. it does a number to you in terms of your emotional psychological safety because you get into that fear of i may not have a job then i may not be able to provide for my family then what's my family going yes. to do and you go down down the spiral because you just don't know what's going to happen so it, it's it's such a crazy place to live in where, where you're constantly thinking about your job because you could be doing everything right you could be the best employee there is and a decision from the higher ups or that is not logical yeah. can essentially just eliminate all that. Yeah. You know? and, and again, a lot of times there are no loss of, loss of job, but just the fact that there's a fear of it mm-hmm. and that can that in itself can cause like, some kind of um, discomfort. And I know especially around realignment, you know, if yeah. you're going to get a new boss all of a sudden, you've already gotten used to your old boss. You feel good with that person. And yeah. all of a sudden it's somebody else and it's different personality, different leadership style. Yeah. Um, if your corporate culture has the same consistent culture throughout the company it doesn't matter if it's a different boss yes i but was just going to it, say it, that. it shouldn't but there unfortunately there is that is exactly what i wanted to point out because it's actually not to say that 
there shouldn't be changes because I do think that in especially a large corporation, you should have changes. Mm-hmm. You should be able to be innovative and keep up with the changes of the world, which is constant. So mm-hmm. we should eventually always be growing and evolving. Mm-hmm. There's also a chapter later on. He talks about like there's always going to be changes in generals and um, different leadership. Yeah. That should be expected. Yeah. But that only comes with safety if like you said there's a consistent culture everyone who works there is for the same thing for the same purpose so that you don't think oh the next person is going to come after me or the next person isn't going to be you know believing in the same thing because at the end of the day when you work for someone there has to be some sort of a connection Mm -hmm. that allows you to put your all in you work for a boss you work for a person and that's why a lot of times people quit they quit because of their boss not because of their jobs right right? because you know we we know it we've we've seen the numbers even the stats hr tells us people don't quit their jobs Mm -hmm. they quit their bosses right and that's where we got to figure out how to get in in terms of a company how do you get people all of the leaders aligned on the same message and going after the same thing so that when there are changes the employees aren't scared. Exactly. That's so true. And, you know, kind of going back to it, a lot of people will also attribute loss of uh, or decreasing pay or, or less pay as mm-hmm. a reason. Most employees don't actually quit because of less pay. Yes. They right. don't. They, they they stay on because it's, I mean, they, they lose, they leave because of the bosses and the culture that's in their yes. environment versus, you know, whatever amount of money they're making. Right. We've, we've read books, all uh, our previous books that talk about um, companies who have made, have made huge cuts in pay, but their employees are like, yes, if you take a pay cut and don't eliminate positions, Mm -hmm. employees are more willing to Mm -hmm. live with that, knowing that there's going to be job security, knowing that there's not going to be layoffs. They'll sacrifice that for the greater good of the whole company. And I'm sure that there's a lot of listeners and viewers out there that will probably say, yeah, right. I would leave the company if they took my pay away. Yeah. And that's probably because you're in a company where the culture is like that, too. I think a lot of times people who have that mindset is because they know that in the company, they wouldn't they wouldn't take a pay cut for that company. I think because they value value the finances because they don't see value in the purpose or the job. But if you love your job, Mm -hmm. then a minimal pay cut would be worth it to you because then you would be able to work with people that you like. You'd be able to work for a company that is in line with your vision and your purpose. And sometimes I think for the most part, that is invaluable. You can't put a pay on that. Yeah. And going back to the war, you know, analogy in this, right? If if you have, if you're in a war and you're, and you have your troops and they're really bought into your purpose and they're willing to die for you, right? Most troops are. If you tell them, Hey, I'm going to have to cut one of your meals because we need to save up for this upcoming winter. No one's going to be like, Oh, screw you. I I need my, I need my food, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. They're not going to say that. They're going to say, Oh no! I, I you know what I'll do. I'll do whatever, whatever is needed for the better betterment of of the army and of the of the of the team. Because of camaraderie, yeah, you build a culture in which it's so strong to have that team where they would say, I, "We'd rather cut one meal together versus cutting one portion of the troop and laying them off and sending yeah. them home." They'd rather stay together and sacrifice together versus looking more of a selfish view of, of taking that extra meal and losing their mates. Great. All right. So uh, book four is about how to think of war. Yes. So, um, you know, in the, in the book, he kind of goes over like, you know, warlords who have mastered defense, they attack from hidden places. Right. So um, they know at all times when the attack is going to happen, where it's going to happen, where the weakest points are, are at. And they also know, classic basketball term defense is the best offense right so a lot of times you want to make sure that you are putting the pressure but at the same time you yourself are grounded and your team is fully ready for the attack so you want to make sure you have a very progressive idea you're getting uh, input from your army you're getting input from the surrounding people and also thinking outside the box right so uh, making sure that you surprise the enemy yeah. or you surprise how you're going to attack the thing at, at work too. Yeah. So. so war is not just a straightforward exactly. charge forward and fight. There's a lot of planning and strategy that goes into yeah. it before you fight. So thinking through everything. I And that goes into book five, the next chapter, using the power of heaven. Yes. Right? And I think this is where he goes through more of that. Um, you know, he uses the word heaven and it, it, as an interpretation, I'm not sure if it's more of like an actual 
God or because this was written so long ago, it's just like the spirits and the... Yeah, he kind of mentioned it because of the environment, right? Mm-hmm. So it, things that are ever-changing. Yeah. Um, this is where, I, I think this is where he talks about like, just do good. Worry mm-hmm. about yourself. Worry about what you're doing and heaven will see it mm-hmm. and reward you for the good that you do because if you do things in deceit, then heaven will see it and will grant you with like dishonorable type outcomes of war also kind of going in, into that is around management of resources too so make sure you have a system of leaders for for development that are going to be there to also make sure that that, that everyone is working within their normal um, jobs and expectations right? yeah it's so important to have people that 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 you oversee mm-hmm. that oversee other people I love that yes. that's actually how I used to run my team I always had a um, my old boss we call it my my infrastructure right because I, I built this you know I had a group of captains that reported to me mm-hmm. and then they had their own teams mm-hmm. and within their teams they had the captains that reported mm-hmm. to them so it was always this organizational structure that I started within my small group of people, but it only it allowed me to only have to check in with mm-hmm. X amount of people. And then it allowed the autonomy for them to be their own bosses of their own troops. Yes. He talks in here about how it's important to create identity for people. And the way that you create identity is by creating small groups, because if you're part of something so big, it's easy to get lost. Mm -hmm. But if you're part of a smaller group within that big group, you have a voice Mm -hmm. and you feel a sense of power and control and ownership over something. And that's when people feel good about the value of their work and they therefore can march on and fight for you. Yeah. And and the key word there is ownership, right? So uh, having the ownership and having a team uh, of people who, have ownership of, of other people and and what they need to oversee. I think that's so important, and it kind of helps you just rally yourself mm-hmm. in in your environment, yeah. right? Um, and then he also kind of says in the in the book is around you know don't overstep. Yes. So, so don't don't talk down. Don't don't talk to the people that 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 person's overseeing. Talk yes. to the person, help yep. them, mm-hmm. so that way they can feel feel confident to help their other people. Yep. And I know a lot of times, uh, especially in corporate culture, bosses like to kind of yell at the they overstep the person in the middle and go straight to the team like you yes. guys are doing this wrong what's mm-hmm. going on over here versus just saying hey l- let me lead through you yes right? and a lot of times that's that's the missing piece yeah i think that's key so why do you think because i've i've seen it a lot people don't like to create that infrastructure mm-hmm. they don't want to have captains within their team mm-hmm. there's a trust factor okay i think um if you don't trust the people that work for you mm-hmm. you're not going to feel comfortable giving them the ownership I'm going to take it beyond that. I don't think that it's a trust factor. I think that you can have people that you trust. Mm -hmm. I think it's also an ego factor. Mm, You don't want to have someone else have control because if you have captains within your team, that means that you are no longer the commander of all, Right. right? You don't, see what's going on and if something goes wrong then the blame is on you you take it personally whereas if you i think if you're able to look beyond that and let go of the ego then you can say okay if something goes wrong it's Mm -hmm. not my fault i gave you the autonomy to lead now let's sit down and talk through what went wrong and how can we fix it but having that mistake or that failure in the first place is in our society today something that's not acceptable you can't have things go wrong so if we go to book six fortitude and frailty mm-hmm. give it a summary of it when you prepare for battle be the first one into the arena of combat and do not shrink to fear or doubt so being fragile is not good for war okay why is that? So this is where I would say, you know, and you're saying like it's all applicable. This is where I was kind of like, mm, I'm not because he, he says here you cannot be vulnerable. Mm-hmm. And I actually think vulnerability is very important. Okay. I think when you show your emotions, you show where your vulnerability is. People tend to help you. People tend to, to connect with you versus you being that like tough person all the time. I got, I have everything and I'm in control. If you show that, hey, I need help and ask for help people are more likely to help you. I think my only rebuttal to that is a lot a lot of times people are not playing the same game. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So if you're going to be vulnerable... You have to know who to be vulnerable to, yes, right? That trust right. factor is yes. there. But how do you create that? Because there's, you know, like Brene Brown says, you in order to be vulnerable, you have to have trust. But in order to have trust, you have to be vulnerable. Well, that's why the, the big thing here is we're, we're in book six. 
right, for this. So that means that we've already gotten gone through a stage where you've built a relationship with yep. the team, you build a trust factor. That's true. You've done all of the legwork to get to this point. Now you're gonna you're gonna make sure that you're not gonna. So if you're to this point, then can't you be vulnerable now? With your team, you could be, mm-hmm. but not with everybody else. Okay. You don't want to show your enemy that you're vulnerable. Yeah, that's right? true. And it's quite, kind of what he's saying in, in, in terms of the war. You don't, want, you don't want to show any weaknesses to your enemy because that's exactly where they'll strike. So in here, he talks about um, when you're talking about striking and with your enemies, he talks about a larger force mm-hmm. doesn't necessarily beat out a smaller yes. force. And I thought that was very, it, it brought me back to to work because, you know, when you think about a larger force, you automatically sometimes think, oh, uh, the power of many mm-hmm. and that a, a larger group will win. But he says, if you can infiltrate from the inside, you can defeat any mm-hmm. size army. And I, I thought of that in terms of if you can infiltrate a company with people who are pessimists, people who complain. Mm-hmm. You just need a couple of people who are dissatisfied and that will spread within very quickly. It's just like yeah. wildfire. Book seven is a manipulation of circumstance. Yes. So this one is all about how to, when you say manipulation, I've, I've learned through a lot of our readings. I used to think manipulation is a Bad. negative right. term, but it really isn't, right. right? So manipulation of circumstances really like whatever situation you're in, you got to turn it to your advantage mm-hmm. and figure out how to solve through it. Yep. So there's a lot of people, I as I was reading this, I, I was thinking of people who play the blame game or the victim game and right. they're like, oh, this is a situation that happens to me. I can't do anything about it. This sucks. Mm-hmm. But if you know how to manipulate the circumstance, you can turn it to your benefit and figure out a solution. There's always a solution. There's always a solution. There's also a, a, a point to be made that not to be too concerned with just the end result of something, right? Mm-hmm. You want to make yep. sure that you are spending more time on thinking outside the box and looking at different ways to get to the solution, but not be so just focused on, hey, this is, well, this is the metric we need to meet or goal we need to meet. Mm-hmm. Don't think about that. Think yeah. about what you need to do and, and different ways to get to that level. I think a lot of times, and, that's, and again, that's how you manipulate the, the environment you're in because you're, you're changing that behavior of just saying, hey, this is what this is the end of the war. This is the end of the goal we have to meet, and it's what we are going to strive towards. Yeah. When you set it like that, then people will will either play dirty or they'll do whatever they need to do because they're just trying to get to the end exactly. game. Exactly. Yeah. You, you you want to try to avoid that. Is this the same as um, progress? Any progress is progress versus like not doing anything at right, all. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. as long as you're moving the needle on something, you're thinking about the next progressive step and advancement that you can take versus saying I'm either winning or losing. Like you're just at least moving. Okay. What is the title book? Eight? So this is variations of reality in war. So yes. it's like a reality TV show. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it could be right. Um, but it pretty much is. It means that you have to understand that there are a variety of things um, that will happen kind of being, you have to make sure that you're very adaptable yeah. Um, and making sure that, you know, your your troops, as as you said, that they're encamped where their safety is, you know, if there's, if, there's a, if there's at risk that you make sure you're protecting them. So you want to make sure you're creating an environment, the reality for them that is safe, yeah. that, that, that um, you try to prevent as many variations as possible. Uh, a big one that we just talked about earlier is psychological safety, right? You want to make sure your team feels comfortable yeah. and, and that they feel like they have a space that they can discuss their concerns. So he's talking about variations is good though. Yes. Yeah, sorry, right. sorry. So variations is yeah. good um, because it allows your team to shift their focus on what's important mm-hmm. versus like you said with the encampment part of it, right? If you're not camped where you're safe, mm-hmm. then they're going to spend their energy thinking about how they're going to survive and they're not going to be able to spend their energy thinking about war strategies. Yes kind of going back to the corporate culture, right? Making sure the energy for your team is spent on the work and moving it and further improving on the progress versus just them being alert or defensive. And yeah. the one thing that comes to mind is that, you know, when, when you have somebody that's struggling at, at your, at your, uh, that works for you, um, they'll start to get defensive. They'll say, oh, this is what was wrong. This is what was wrong mm-hmm. when they have that mindset, right? Yeah. But, you, but if they know they're in a, a very, psychological safe place they can just say hey my boss can come to me i'm going to tell him hey this is what i'm struggling with and this is the work i've put in this is what i want to get to and this and how can this person help me that's what you want versus when you walk in they're like oh my god colina's here to yell at me for another half hour about something 
Like that's the alert and defensiveness yeah. you want to avoid. I'm going to clarify right there. I do not walk in and yell at people. I think the perception is I'm yelling because I am sharing information <laughs> in, in that a, should have been covered in your training. <laughs> so for all of our listeners, notice how the spike in the, the volume in just the went over <laughs> In the defensiveness right there. Right? <laughs> You're playing a good war game right here, Tapas. <laughs> there you go. Moving on to book nine, The yes. Virtue of Changing Positions. Um, again, adaptable, right? So Resiliency. Make sure you, you, your, your army is resilient. Enemies themselves will be resilient and they're going to change your tactics. You have to make sure that you, uh, you're constantly changing your thought process and your preparations yep. and your behavior, especially for your team. You, you, you should go into every single project with your team saying that, hey, there's going to be things that, that will go the wrong way. Yeah. How do we prepare for right now? Right? Let's just talk through it. And then when that time comes, hey, we're ready for it. Or always expect that, hey, this, something's going to go bad any anytime. We never know. Yeah. So you said that we're their preparedness. Yes. So it's not just expecting it, but also being ready for yeah. it when it happens too. So when there are changes in leadership, when there are changes, like you said, in projects and teams and your responsibilities shift, you should know that's already going to happen. Mm -hmm. And then are you prepared and ready for that? Do you have the tools for you to excel in the next yes. uh, step? Because I think a lot of setbacks for people like that roadblock right there is that they can't get over the fact that things have changed. They can't get over the fact that they're on a new team. They can't get over the mm -hmm. fact that um, it's not what they're used to because people are creatures of habit, mm -hmm. right? So now how do we uh, stretch ourselves and realize that habits and constant um, is not the norm. How do, how do we make sure that the co the company culture keeps the thought process of change in mind at all times? Because a lot of times they have this thing that, hey, this is what we need to do to execute mm -hmm. and everyone get on the same page and do it now Yeah. versus opening up the room for possibility of change. Why, I, why do people struggle with that? I think that's multifaceted because, you know, one, it could be the way that the message is delivered, right? Mm -hmm. Like we have to change this. Two, was there enough time and preparation put into it? Three, like, are we taking the consideration? Are these changes coming from uh, feedback from our team? Is mm -hmm. this something that they're saying that they need? Is this something that the community or our consumers are telling us that we need? Taking all of that into consideration as to like, is this the right next move? Yes. And then is there that psychological safety for people to say, this is how I feel about this. And then there, after that, is there room to wiggle room to kind of change and improve on the plan that's coming out yeah. versus it being more of a dictatorship. This is a change. This is going to yes. happen tomorrow. And there we go. Don't at deviate it. From the yeah. So right. that culture of that, right. And yeah. we've, we've seen some of that where it's like, this is the quote, quote, best practice. This is what the playbook says. Mm -hmm. This is what it is. And that's, the only way to look at yeah. things when we know, you know, in theory, a lot of things that roll out. Yes, that is great in an ideal situation. Mm -hmm. But because the world is not ideal, we need to have room and leave room for the feedback from our people that's actually fighting the war for us. Exactly. And, and I think just just having that mentality, especially when whenever there's any kind of rollout like that, it's so freeing when when your team can say, Okay, this is a change that we expected. This is this is or, or this is this is our concerns that we're expecting to see. Yeah. And when when the company acknowledges that, yes. it's so like it's it's such an empowering thing. You feel again, it goes back to people just feeling like they have much more control over their that their they're job. being heard. Yeah. yeah. Like I and, and, and that's kind of what we did, you know, like when I was um doing my old role, like we would have meetings and I would say, All right guys, here's what we're gonna here's what we're planning to do, here's what's coming up, corporate's telling us this. Mm -hmm. All right, let's, let's let's do a round of hands, who has concerns? And people yeah. would just start saying, Hey, this is this, this is that and we just sit there and listen, okay, like so if that happens, okay, cool, that makes sense. Yeah. That's me I can bring up to corporate or if that ever ha was happening to us, let's make sure we deviate the path. Yeah. But just the fact that they felt that they were heard. Yeah. And the fact that they can give the input versus just me saying, here you guys go. This is what's next. This is Do what's it. next. I think as, as we're talking through this, the art of war itself, I have a better appreciation for those that actually are in the, the militia and, the, and um, having to fight because there's a lot of strategy that goes into it. Being from the outside looking in, you think that it's just war, mm -hmm. charge forward and just fight without any of the consideration because you don't really think that like, Hey, in the army that they're 
thinking about this stuff, mm-hmm. that there's putting all that preparation and the, and the time into it because it just feels so, um, you know, manly in charge yeah. and whatnot. And, you know, I'm, I'm wearing a, a Marines hat. My, my stepdad was in the Marines. And so I'm, I'm very familiar with that uh, mentality and approach of things. But reading this, it gives you an appreciation mm-hmm. for the art of war. All right. Book 10. Control and maintenance of territory. Um, so there are six terrains that he mentions, right? So first one is around accessible ground, so the ground that both you and your opponent can easily traverse. There's entangling ground, so ground that's that is difficult to reoccupy once you abandon it. Um, there's this temporizing ground. There's narrow passes, precipitous heights, and then the last one is positions at a great distance. Take another sip of tequila. <laughs> <laughs> the last one is positions at a great distance from your opponent. Okay. So um, pretty much the, the the main you know the gist of this is to make sure that you manage to learn and how to go through all of these terrains. Yeah. Right. It's not about just having the skill set to conquer one type of terrain or one kind of situation. Yeah. You have to make sure that you're able to ne- negotiate and effectively fight during in, in all types of situations. And yeah. same thing with the team, right? You have to make sure that um, there's different perspectives, there's different personalities that are, that are in your team. And there's also different types of ways to do the project or said changes, whatever is happening. You want to make sure that everyone can, everyone feels comfortable in each terrain. Yeah, I, that's what I took away from this chapter is the terrains for me felt like the perspective, like Mm -hmm. you said, and the ideas of other people. You're going to come across very different ideals and different ways of doing Mm -hmm. things and just being open and flexible to hearing it out yes. and um again not feeling like there's only one way to do things yes yep all righty and then so we are on book 11 conducting and managing campaigns yes so there are nine fundamental elements of war okay uh do you want to go through them i mean we won't, we won't go individually into them okay so wanna... dissipation mm-hmm. bordering coincidence correspondence concentration, signification, laboring, and the place of entrapment. And finally, the place of death. The elements are very similar to the previous chapter of Mm. the different terrains. It really is being prepared for all possibilities that can exist when you're fighting a war. Um, It's planning and it's uh, being flexible. It's being resilient and just making sure that you are ready for everything that comes your way. Book 12 is called The Fierceness in Combat. So being fierce. Yes. What does being fierce mean? Being fierce in all that you do. So have supplies on hand, um, know the right timing, what type of fighting required, and then, of course, do not hesitate. You want to make sure that you are, um, when you kind of going back to what Robert says, when you can, you destroy the enemy, right? So you want to make sure that um, you are not letting go and and not letting up. That was probably one of my least favorite laws. (laughs) Yeah. Completely destroy your enemy. Yes. So. He says here, fierceness is a natural state when troops see the wisdom of their leader. Yes. Right. So that means in, in the corporate world, if you are a naturally wise leader, mm-hmm. your team will fight with you. They will be fierce in all that they do because they trust you. They know that you're leading them to victory and not to their doom. That's kind of going back to making sure that you're not vulnerable, right? If you're going to be very vulnerable with them, then they may not see the fierceness in you. Yeah, I disagree with that. Okay, please explain. Again, just because I think vulnerability is a good thing. I'm, I'm yeah. a very hardcore advocate for right, Brene right. Brown and that vulnerability <laughs> and the trust. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it, it, given that with war, uh, you have to make sure, in, in a little term with war, is that if you're going to show no fierceness and no and, and remorsefulness, mm-hmm. then that could cost the lives of, of your troops, yeah. right? So, like, and I know in, in a corporate culture, it's not as intense as that. Obviously, you no know, one's going to lose your life. Depends on what corporate you're in. Right. <laughs> you will but, lose your life. <laughs> but, you know, there, there should be a sense of fierceness, right? And and, and your team will also will, will also act the way that the leader acts, yeah. especially a team that's fully bought in. Yeah. Um, so if you have that, that fierce mentality, your team will follow that as well. So I think, and, and I say that because I actually struggle with the, the whole fierceness. I'm like, I'm, I'm a very soft person, so mm-hmm. I don't have necessarily a fierce side to me. Um, only unless if you like really piss me off, but 
besides that, I'm not, when it comes to preparation, I'm never seen more, you pissed off. <laughs> right. So it's, it's never come out. I try every day. <laughs> <laughs> I wake up and I'm like daily affirmation. My goal is to piss off tapas. It's not going to happen. Doesn't but, happen. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, it, I, th- I think that's something that I still struggle with because I'm, I'm not as, uh, as fierce as, yeah. as they say. Yeah. I think it just depends on what your definition is mm-hmm. of all of this. And that's where I say like, this is the one, one part of the book that I disagree with in terms of it standing the test of time mm-hmm. is that our time has progressed and changed changed mm-hmm. a lot into what is acceptable in the workplace um the idea that tough love is what you have to give like that's no yeah. longer the direction right that's generationally that's what we had before and then to overcompensate for that there was that over coddling mm-hmm. and and going to the extreme and now i think it's kind of balancing out to like how do we have a good fine balance but lean more towards of the vulnerable side and psychological safety mm-hmm. emotional intelligence like that type of environment where i feel like the concept of art of war in terms of vulnerability is a little bit outdated yeah i, I agree i agree you don't have to agree with me. No, that would make sense. That makes sense. When you say it that way, that makes sense. <laughs> Book 13, Spies and Traitors. This one was fun. This is yes. a good way to end it. Makes me feel like, um, you know, like a spy novel, superhero right. type thing. This yeah. is definitely, um, this is definitely, you can tell the inspiration for 48 Laws came from this too. Because, you know, making sure that you're always in the know, making sure that, you know, uh, information is resource. So you, you have to make sure that you have a way of gathering uh, information yes. about what's going on, and obviously in war, that's very important. You want to know what the enemy is doing, what the what the next tactic is going to be. Yeah. But also with corporate war, yeah. like you you have to be in and know what's happening around you as yeah. well. So the what he says is knowledge and information is a resource and therefore Mm -hmm. if you don't listen then you're wasting your resource Mm -hmm. a lot of times what i would do wrong is i actually you know keep my head down and i don't like listening to gossip i don't like listening to hearsay but if you are good at your job you have to listen to all that you have to hear what's kind of going and rumbling around with your team Mm -hmm. so that you can either nip it in the bud or leverage that for your next point of communication and address what's going on in the field. Yep. Five types of spies. There's a foreign spy, which is comes from the enemy country. Usually somebody who is displeased from the other side, they, they come over to you. Internal, so agents that work for you, that go against you. Um, counter agents, so internal spies who are, who have been found out, so they act with treason to save their lives or like double, double spies. agents, yeah, double, double spies. agents, <laughs> uh, extraneous, unt- untrust, untrustworthy spies that we feed false information to, and lastly, vital spies, so natural natural citizens that devote their lives into the foreign countries and return information. So those are the good spies, right? Yeah, he says in here, everyone has their place and everyone has their value, yes. and so it just. You know, every all sorts of communication that comes to you, little, small, big, whatever, that has to be taken into consideration for your play. Alrighty, and those are the the, that's the act of war. Of war. Overall, what did you think? Um, I think it's a book that you really have to reflect on and think. Yeah. Um, there are certain things as you're reading through it, it's just it's easier. Like, oh, I get how that that applies into the workplace. But other, if you're reading it just for the concept of art of war, it sounds very. Um, harsh because Mm -hmm. it it sounds like you're just like charging and going for it but if you understand the underlining message of it then it's much more applicable yeah i think when i first read this book i was like why do people like this book so much like it's such a mean book (laughs) like (laughs) like there's so many things it's like it's 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 a very aggressive book Mm -hmm. um similar to similar to the 48 laws of power but i think this book in itself like when when i started to think about how it it actually the, the true meaning behind it was you want to avoid war at all costs. You want to win with strategy. That's where it happens. Therefore, you prepare. Wanna, yes. You want to have no loss of life. You want to make sure that that it, everything gets settled out with a handshake, right? Yeah. That's like that's the gist of it. Um, when I when I understood that concept, I was like, oh, okay, this this book makes sense. So yeah. for anybody who has you know read this book in the past and they put it down because they thought it was too aggressive, like myself, give it another whirl. I would definitely say think of it in that way where it's not about necessarily killing your enemy and Don't destroying. Don't take it literally. Yes, it's it's more about negotiating and also making sure that your own army is well prepared yeah. to second your team. And sometimes when you're thinking we were reading through like destroying the enemy or anything like that, it's not necessarily even the person, but right. potentially the enemy within you yeah. and the the negative parts of you or the, the parts of you that hold you back and is the challenge to yourself yeah. and your own growth. Yep. Right, so um, this one much more um, interpretive mm-hmm. versus Forty Eight Laws of Power. Yes. I think Forty Eight Laws is interpretive, but um, is is uh, much more defined for yeah. you. And this one is 
more of that heavenly worldly type approach to it and that is the art of war thank you guys so much for joining us today hopefully having a glass of sipping tequila as well and we hope to see you again let's vibe with books bye guys bye